Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm here today with LinkedIn and Instagram legend, Ira Bowman. Ira, how you doing today, brother? I'm good, man. It makes me laugh when people introduce me that way, but okay. <laughs> I'm doing good, thank you. Hey, I feel the same way when people start talking about the things that I've done. I'm like, man, that guy sounds great. Who are you talking about? Oh, that's yeah. me. Oh, that's right. I do. Yeah, Because we just feel like we're regular people most, most of the time. We don't feel like celebrities or whatever else. I don't consider myself a celebrity. I know you don't either. So when someone talks about us that way, like, really? Like, that's me? And you're like, oh, yeah, I guess I have done some things. That's interesting. It, you is, were kind of it is weird. It is definitely weird when you start to think about it. I was at a San Jose Sharks game back in, I think, 2020. And at the time, I had like 30,000 followers or 30,000 connections. And the stadium, the seating capacity of the stadium was 17,000 people. And I said, wow, that's a lot of people. And then I realized I have twice as many people connected to me on LinkedIn. And it just like for the first time, I was able to visualize how many people that was actually. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it certainly is weird. And it's, it's weird to think about because you look at like all the platforms we have together and all the people we're connected to. I mean, phone calls and emails and Zooms that we end up doing. And then we end up doing something like a podcast like I've done for the past three years. And uh, in an organization that we're both part of, you end up meeting people all over the planet. It's just so weird to think how great it is to be connected to everybody. But you are the only one I know that is closing in on 200,000 followers on LinkedIn and has over 100,000 on Instagram. But there's a, so much more to you than just those kind of numbers because you run Bowman Digital Media, you do photography, you love creating digital products and doing all that stuff. You also have a nonprofit that you run called Project Help You Grow. Uh, you've done so many amazing things, yet you're so humble. I'm really happy that you're on the show today. Give us a little bit about your background. Well, the first thing about me that everybody seems to get a kick out of is uh, I'll be married uh, 22 years in just a few days, June and later in June. But uh, I have eight kids and everybody, it's like they go, a back and they're like what you have you have eight kids and i'm like yeah and then they asked me if i'm mormon or catholic or if i know how that happens and the answer to that is no no and yes i do know how it happens <laughs> but uh, happy wife happy life so i have a hashtag called strive for nine and she hit me with eight is enough so there you go eight is enough. <laughs> i remember doing my family my family tree a number of years ago working my genealogy and we got back to the 1300s in norway which is just crazy that someone someone had done most of the work for me already, but you see they were we were farmers in Norway came over to northern Minnesota continued being farmers and you see just how many kids are being born back when the infant mortality rate was around fifty percent we didn't have industrialized farming like you needed the more hands you had the more likely your farm was to succeed to help yeah. make any kind of income, but you're in San Diego so you're in San Diego area and you're not running a farm. You're not Mormon or Catholic or running that stuff. Yeah, no. But. So I live in I live in the Inland Empire, which is a little confusing for people because the Inland the Inland Empire is not really LA, but we can actually consider ourselves Greater Los Angeles. So like if you look at the map, but we're we're close to San Diego too. So I'm able to go to all the SoCal stuff. But yeah, no, I live in the desert. So there's no farms here unless you're farming like ants. There's the ant farms and palm trees, maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did. We didn't actually. We moved here in 2020. So right in the beginning of 2020 is when we came down here. Um, my wife and I are from the Bay Area, and I grew up in Las Vegas. So uh, no, no farming in our in our history, at least not the immediate history. But yeah. I'm just picturing you and your wife for you know 22 years in uh, the desert. I just picture Tatsuine to see the moisture farmers out there just scrapping for every little bit that they can. Is one of your kids going to be a Jedi when they grow up? Maybe. You never know. You never know. I've got a kid who, honestly, I'm not even kidding. She's 14 years old. If you ask her what she wants to be for a living, she'll tell you she wants to be a mermaid. I'm not kidding. Well, with the technology that we have now, I think that's probably within the realm of possibilities in her lifetime <laughs> to become a mermaid. <laughs> but I'm not the expert on any of that stuff. But you seem to be the expert on growing your social media. I understand in 2018, you were kind of hovering around 1,500 followers. And by the end of the year, you jumped up to 25,000, now almost 200,000. What did you do? What, what drove you to do something different on LinkedIn, which was a fairly new platform at the time? 
Yeah, so I joined LinkedIn in 2009, and I used it for almost 10 years, like I think a lot of people did. It was more like to connect with the people that you worked with or, you know, your your friends from school. And then I would use it to research. I was in sales, so I was using it to research potential prospects. And I like to network in person. I really like networking events. So what I would do, which I thought was pretty smart at the time, I would get on, I would try to find the list of the people going to a networking event before the event started. And I would look up their LinkedIn profiles and I would kind of, if it was somebody that I thought would be a good prospect for me, I would try to memorize their picture and a little bit about them. So almost like a stalker, but not in a weird way. It's, you know, it's their professional profile, right? So when I would go, then I would try to work in some casual facts or talk about something I thought they would be interested in based on their profiles. And I found that worked really well for me. So that's all I needed LinkedIn for. It was a great tool. But one day I um, just happened to be on the platform and somebody that I'm friends with now, but I didn't really know, but I was connected to them. He was on video and he said some things about LinkedIn and about networking that it seemed, it seemed brash. It seemed like, oh my gosh, I can't, this guy is like out of his mind. But it, it was kind of, it was smart, even though I thought it was off. But at the end, he said something, I'll never forget it. And it changed my life. He said, if you're smart, call me. Now, he wasn't talking to me directly. He was talking to whoever was watching the video. But he said, my phone number's in my profile. If you're smart, call me. And so I was like, well, I'd like to think I'm smart. So I called him. I had, at that time, a two-and-a-half-hour one-way commute because I was living in the – well, I wasn't actually living in the Bay Area. That's the problem. I was living 60 miles outside of San Francisco in a little town called Manteca, which is south of Stockton. But 60 miles, it took two-and-a-half hours to drive there because of the traffic. So I get in my car. It was like, you know, time to go home. I get in my car, and I call this guy's name, Mike O'Connor. I called him, and – he opened my eyes to some things that I'm going to share with you right now. Uh, and I mentioned it in my TED Talk. So if you haven't seen my TED Talk out there, shameless plug, you can watch my TED Talk and you can get more information. But basically, he told me how LinkedIn worked in the, and why it's different. Like, for example, does, does anybody listening, do you understand why there's a first, second, and third level connection on LinkedIn? And why they don't have that on any other social media platform? It's, it's not a coincidence. It actually serves a purpose. And I did not ever think about it. And probably most of you have never thought about it either. Like, who cares? Well, it makes, it makes a, a, a difference. And what is the difference between a connection and a follower? Again, most of you probably have never really thought about that. But it makes a huge difference. So from that point forward, my mind was open to this new, okay, here's how it really works. Now, how do I, now that I know what I know, how do I take that and get where I want to be based on this new information? Well, what, well, what is that? What's the difference between a connection and a follower? And what's okay. this first, second, and third tier level connection? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the first thing you have to understand about LinkedIn is it's the only platform that I know of. And I study this stuff. I offer this social media uh, management is something that my company offers, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable on the topic just as a, as a baseline for your audience. But the only platform that I know of on social media where you do not have access to see everybody's posts, everybody's content without connecting. So LinkedIn, the reason why there's first level, which is someone you're directly connected to, you and I are directly connected on, on LinkedIn. Now, there's people that you're connected to directly that I am not connected to. Those would be my second level connections. And the people that those people that you're directly connected to, not to confuse anybody, but just try to picture this or draw it out, right? Travis is connected to people that Ira isn't. Those are Ira's seconds. And those people are connected to people that you're not. Those become your seconds and they become my thirds. Why is that important? Well, because with LinkedIn, you remember those old games like back in the 80s and 90s? I'm talking about 8-bit Nintendo old games right like zelda legend of zelda love Remember zelda is my favorite game right you had the wooden sword and you would carry this little crappy lantern and you could only see so much of the board when it was nighttime but as the flame got stronger you could see more of the board and linkedin works like that 
your connections, your first, second, and third level connections allow you to see more of the board. Well, here's the thing. When you make posts, why are you making the post? The answer is you want people to see them, right? So if you're not connecting with more people, if you have open slots or wasted slots is a better way to look at it, then you're not maximizing your reach, both for what you can see from a consumer standpoint and what people can see from you as a producer standpoint. It affects both. So here's a little challenge for you. Take any hashtag you want, put it in LinkedIn and search. And I challenge you to find one that isn't a first, second, or third level connection. You will not find one. They'll all be your first, second, or thirds. Now, the biggest hashtag, the largest hashtag on LinkedIn is India, 67 million and change. But the one that more of us would use in the United States is innovation. It's the second largest, comes in at 38 million. So just search innovation, hashtag innovation, 38 million followers, and see how many results you see. And then look and see how many of those are first, second, and third levels. You're going to find you can go as far as you want to go, and it's all going to be first, second, or thirds. Okay. So once I knew that, now what's the, let me finish this lesson. Okay. So the difference between a connection and a follower, what's the difference? Because a lot of people don't know. And there's a huge difference. A follower does not enter your first, second, or third level connections. A follower can see some of what you post. The algorithm will show it in the feed. That's it. But if they don't engage, if they don't make a like or a comment, then everybody that they're connected to has no uh, influence. There's no influence to them. So let's say, Travis, that you, you are connected to me first level. You may not like a post. You may not even see a post. So you're not going to comment, engage with it at all. But other people in your network, your, your first degree, my second, your second, my third, they'll still have an opportunity. The algorithm can show it in the feed. So I could get us get some natural organic pickup that way. But also, if they were to search a hashtag, first, second, or third level, now my results come in their feeds. Even followers, people you're following, their hashtags, if you're not first, second, third, it won't show up in that list. This doesn't work that way. So you have to understand the mechanics of LinkedIn. That's the first part. Now, the other part of LinkedIn, which I kind of already have alluded to, is there's a limited number of people that you can connect to. And that limit, the open power box, if you will, fuse box, is 30,000. So you have 30,000 open fuse slots. And everybody should be trying to put as many of those in as possible. Now, I already know, because I hear this every day, I don't want to connect to everybody. I'm only looking for, quote, unquote, certain people. That's great. You're not going to ever be able to communicate really with 30,000 people. But what you're doing is just opening up the board for searches. So if somebody spams you or they bug you or whatever, then it's not like I say in my marriage. I said this in my TED talk. It's not a marriage contract. You can boot them and replace them as often as you need to until you find the right 30,000. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you connect with somebody, they spam you right away. You don't like that. Just connect with them. Connect with somebody else. But connect with 30,000 and then learn to manage what I call weed your garden, right? Learn to manage it, and you will. But that gives you the power to see and to be seen. And you don't need to do that on any other platform that I am aware of, but LinkedIn is unique. So when I learned that, I went through my Rolodex. Remember those things? You had cards put in them, you'd spin them. And anyways, <laughs> yeah, I had real Rolodexes. Um, I went tell me, through my Tell list. me you uh, graduated in the 90s without telling me you graduated in the 90s. Right. Uh, my Rolodex, my Rolodex, the business cards of my Rolodex. There you go. So I went through, I think I had like 500 cards at the time. And the first thing I did was reach out to all of them and go, okay. But now I still have, you know, at the time I had 28,000 open slots still. So what do you do? Right. Because back then too, if you guys remember, and you can still get in trouble for this to a certain extent, but LinkedIn is much more lenient than it used to be. If you would send a connection request to people that um, you didn't know, they would reject it. And then it would say, okay, well, why did you reject it? And most commonly people would go, I don't know them. And if you got three of those, then LinkedIn would give you an email and say, you're on, you're, you're being warned. You're being warned. You're not supposed to reach out to people that you don't know. That's not how this game is played, even though that's exactly how the game is played. 
because the way they set up the visibility, right? The mechanics suggest that you need to connect to a bunch of people you don't really know. So they, they need to change one or the other, in my opinion, but they haven't. So I created Project Help You Grow in 2018. September of 2018, to be exact, is when I launched the website. But the reason for Project Help You Grow was not what it became in the job search assistance, right? So if you're not familiar with Project Help You Grow, go to projecthelpyougrow.com. You'll see it's like a bridge. We connect job seekers to recruiters and employers around the world. It's free for everybody. Um, there's a lot of good information on there. But when I created it, the idea was actually a growth incubator, which is why it's called Project Help You Grow. Because I'm like, I can't be the only dude on LinkedIn. And I use dude universally, it's for everybody. But you know, I can't be the only person on LinkedIn that has the same problem. Like I got 28,000 open slots and I don't know how to fill it. And certainly I want to fill it. So the idea was this, Travis, I was growing at a growth rate of about 100 people per year. So I thought if I could get 100 people to connect with me in the next two weeks, boy, that would be something. Get a year's worth of growth in two weeks. That's all I was trying to do. So I put up a post, I announced the project. I was asking for people to commit to join the project, which was this. 100 people, myself included, so 99 others would all come together and we would blindly accept each other's connection request. So we'd all grow by 100 and then we'd go our merry way. And that was all it was gonna be. Well, the day I announced it, I had 400 connection requests, just that first day. And that post was seen, by the way, by over 100,000 people, which was my largest post at that point. Like, probably if you added every post I had ever made on all of social media for my whole life and added them together, it probably wasn't seen by 100,000 people, just being honest, right? Yeah. So I knew that I was on to this big idea. It was bigger than what I had, you know, I, I lucked into it honestly. So I said, okay, I, I knew we needed a new forum. So I created a group called project help you grow the group on LinkedIn. And I had people joining it in, in a couple of weeks, I had like four or 5,000 people in the group, but over half of them, cause I'm a numbers guy, I'm a marketing guy, over half of them who joined said, this is awesome. But you know what I really need, Ira? I need help finding a job. And I was like, uh, I'm a sales guy in the print business from the Bay Area. I don't know how to help you find a job in Toledo or in Nebraska, you know, wherever they were. Like, I didn't have any idea. It was, I'm not a recruiter. I'm not an HR person. I didn't even own my own business at that point, right? I'm just, I'm just a guy with an idea on how to get some people some extra followers and, and connections on LinkedIn. So through that, I started making a bunch of friends. And anyways, the Project Help You Grow was born, but that Project Help You Grow was certainly a big part of the wave or the leverage, if you will, that I rode to build my LinkedIn following. It had nothing to do with my Instagram following, but it had everything to do with the first 100,000 people that I have connected with on LinkedIn, I would give 90% 90, 90 of that credit to, to Project Help You Grow. So it's that's, amazing that's what happens so when you have a pretty good idea that's not self-centered, that benefits people, just how quickly that kind of idea can take off and ignite it really is exciting to see some of that stuff happen uh well that's have, you hit it on the head it wasn't it wasn't that ira was anything but a giver that's what made people attracted to me they're like why would you do all this for free because i'll be honest with you i mean i'm always gonna be honest but i had offers for project help you grow when i first launched it over $50,000 people wanted to buy it for me. They were just willing to write me a check. Hey, we just want to take this idea because it's hot. Let me have it. And I was like, no, it's my baby. Like I, I felt like I'm not, I'm not going to sell one of my kids, although I might give you some of them for free. These teenagers, you can have them. But <laughs> anyways, you know, Project Help Me Grow, it wasn't for sale. And then I had people trying to join me as a business partner, but you know, then they wanted to change it. And I was like, oh, I don't want to change it because I never got into it for money. It was always it was always just a way to help people. Like I said, the mission changed because the, I let the people determine the mission, ultimately. But, but the thing that you said that resonates and is absolutely true is, and and people will tell you they liked Ira because they, when you see me and you see my white glasses because I wear white glasses, right? You might think ego and all these things, but then you talk to me and you realize it's not who I am, and certainly I'm not a selfish person at all. 
So I drive a Kia. You know what I mean? I don't drive a Mercedes or a BMW or anything else. You know what I mean? I drive I drive one of the cheapest cars uh, there are. <laughs> so, you know, other than paying for the kids, which I do through my business, you know, film and digital media now, um, Project Help Grows, I've committed to keep it a free project forever. That's that's my commitment. Yeah, no, I, I like that about you. So those of you that don't know, I had the opportunity to spend a week with IRA. We were at a ranch in Texas and there was a lot of business training. There was about uh, 20 or so people there in attendance. You know, most of us learning some part of the staff and whatnot. It's just an amazing, absolutely amazing ranch. Fletcher Cox was nice enough to host our group, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snacks, booze covered. We had live music. I think Ira even snapped some photos of me uh, singing karaoke, and then we had a flag football game, which was which was a whole lot of fun. I got pictures of you rolling around scoring a touchdown, brother. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> proof, proof that I've uh, that I've done something with my life. Apparently, I don't yes. know. I, I sent those. You caught to our that touchdown pass from Fletcher Cox, y'all. I mean, how many people could say that? Uh, not too many. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> not too many people. For those of you who don't know, Fletcher Cox is like the star defensive line men from the Philadelphia Eagles currently. Yeah, uh, so it was just a, just a lot of fun. Probably. When we the best part about the ranch and the best part about that experience, other than than the learning, was really building those connections and building those relationships. And when you get time to spend with someone like Ira, who is by all accounts, a regular dude who has done some amazing things and just has the heart of a giver, it really helps to build that connection. It changes your really perception of who these people are. When we see things on social media, pick your channel, doesn't matter what your channel is. Largely, we only see their highlight reel. Yeah. We don't get to see who they are uh, day by day. I talked to a few people that are have quite the following. I get to interview Steve Sims and he's like, we've done all this carefully creative and cultivated ads and videos and all this stuff. And he was like, of all the stuff I do, if I hop on and do a live and I'm just myself from the heart, I have five times the engagement of any of the stuff that I spent thousands of dollars creating. That's 100% true. So when I, because I'm a professional photographer, look, I've got, I mean, I can't even tell you how many cameras I've got, but I mean, I've got, I've got cameras everywhere. Okay. So I do really good photography work on Instagram and I'll put these photos that I'm really proud of. And, you know, I get, I get a certain amount of activity, but I'll take a selfie photo of me that I don't even want to put up, but I know my, my, my users like it and I'll put up and I'll get, like you say, 5X, 10X the response um it's it's always you know people want to see the heart they want to know they don't they actually i think it the word is authentic if you keep it authentic it's actually better so yeah i i know when i started doing things in social media i started this podcast and stuff like i didn't want to go live <laughs> in fact when i started the podcast and we were recording on zoom via video i would hide the screen behind another screen or i would put a card or something up you know, so I wouldn't have to look at myself because we get self-conscious. We have all yeah. these things that we don't like about ourselves that we are insecure about or whatever the thing is. And so if we're looking at ourselves, just like a lot of people look in the mirror, like they don't want to see that stuff. Right. And, but once you start doing it and once you start posting, once you start sharing who you are in your life and experiences, you do that five, 10, 20 times, all of a sudden you stop caring what uh, everyone's seeing. And like, I didn't post the video for a long time. Cause I don't have a high opinion of my personal appearance yeah. and you know, I you, had my you, fans, you know people that both, were brother. Look at me. I, <laughs> I, I actually made a joke in my Ted talk. I'm like, you don't have to be rich or famous or handsome. I said, look at me. I got a visceral laugh from the crowd. Like they were like, yeah, buddy, if you could do it, anybody could do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we all kind of have whatever feeling about ourselves or whatever it is. And I had people that were listening to the show reaching out to me. We're like, we love what you're doing. We want to see you on video. You're talking about this stuff. And they're like, I know you use your hands. You've got great facial expressions. Like, we want to see you. And I was reluctant to do it just because of how I felt about myself. Yeah, Here, you know, it's funny. So talking about that and talking about the ranch, just to kind of tie those all together. When you're singing karaoke, and I think it was Baby Got Back, just to be like full disclosure here. I think this was the song because I think you did more than one, right? But. During Baby Got Back, I mean, 
the way you use your hands and and some of the dance moves and the facial expressions like you were in it and you were just completely entertaining the whole crowd i mean we're talking about 20 people here so it's not like we're playing to a large stadium but everybody i mean we were in it and if the song had gone on for five more minutes we would have been with you the whole extra time i mean it was you are entertaining for sure but i mean people i get what you're saying i have the same thing like i don't like the way i look but I'm used to seeing myself on camera now because I go live almost every day. So, you know, it's it's old hat now. But the first time, like I had to upgrade, as you and I have talked about off camera, right? I had to upgrade all my stuff because it was like, at least I can have like not, it not it's not fuzzy and you can see everything and the sound quality is semi-decent. It drives me nuts when something that, <laughs> like before we started this show, I was fixing my backdrop because it was crooked and there was a little wrinkle in the in the backdrop i'm like you want it to be good at least yeah i don't i'm not a, i'm not a plastic surgeon i can't change the way i look you know so i could yeah we say all of that stuff to say this when you act as yourself your true authentic self you show up and you build connections with real people most of that stuff doesn't matter it doesn't how you matter look at all? doesn't yeah. matter in the slightest i told a friend of mine a couple of years ago like I forget how we got into the conversation, but I said, I only hang out with beautiful people. <laughs> and she took that as the full meaning right up front is that it was beauty in the inside. inside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when you have the true beauty on the inside, regardless yeah. of the symmetry of your face, or if you have blemishes, or if you lost an ear in combat, regardless of all those stuff, right? If you've got that inner beauty that shines out, it's not going to matter what your physical appearance looks like. It's not going to matter. No, yeah, what, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, you're not on, under, you're not on Tinder. Percent. You're you're feeling yeah. the feeling. You're seeing who they are as true, beautiful people. And that's the only kind of people I hang out with. I don't have time for people that are ugly on the inside, that are nasty, yeah. bad stabbing, uh, well, gossipers. I talk, about, I talk about inner circle a lot. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you know, you know who my inner circle is, so... You yeah. know what I mean? Like, there's not too many people that you don't know that are on my inner circle already. You know what I mean? But why are they those people? Because, like you said, they're they're real, and they're they're not just about themselves. There's a lot of people that aren't necessarily ugly, but they're all about themselves, right? They're they're only interested in furthering their own experience, and they'll work with you as long as you're working to that end. But what I like about the group that that I'm referring to, and that you know is uh, there's a lot of people that will bend over backwards to help you, even if there's nothing in it for them. To me, that's beautiful people too. I, the, the group that we're talking about that we're going to be kind of cloak and dagger about uh, is amazing. Every time I'm around that group of people where there's one or many, like every part of my being feels alive. Yeah. My hair. Yeah. And you kind of forget all, everything else, right? You're just yes. like, you're there in that moment. Completely and you present. you don't want that moment to end. Yes. Yeah. It, I, so those are the, they follow me closely. They look at all my social media stuff. Like I went and did a week at the ranch with Ira and the crew, but then I also went to several other cities and I stopped and I had lunch in between. Yeah. Yeah. So like I took our friend Kareen down to the DFW and then I stopped and saw my friend Denny in Pflugerville before I spent five days in San Antonio. And I drove to Pensacola, but I stopped at Lake Charles on the way to see my buddy, David. Yeah. And his massive house. This guy's got a ridiculous size. Now, full disclosure, I used to live and work in the San Antonio Austin area in a, in a town called New Braunfels. So, if anybody's listening out there, shout out to you and uh, all the fun shenanigans what we used to have. But so I've driven through Lake Charles, and my daughter goes to school in Florida. Like I can picture this whole this. Whole oh trip. yeah, oh yeah, this whole trip. But I met people in this group at every stop along the way. Yeah. David was in between and like Charles, he's in the group. I spent three or four days in Pensacola with people in the group. I drove to North Carolina, but not after uh, stopping in Atlanta to have lunch with three of the guys in the group. And then I hightailed it back across the country, stopped in Nashville with the guy who's uh, now a new member of the group. Like yeah. it's about is. building real relationships and community, no matter what your group is or what it's called, yep. because this wouldn't happen. My conversation here with Ira wouldn't have happened unless we actually took the time to build a relationship and so right. many people out there, so many businesses, so many nonprofits, they throw up 
a social profile or they throw up a website and they say, why am I not a millionaire yet? Why don't we have 10 million in donations yet? And it's because a lot of them don't use those platforms to build relationships and they don't use their website to post weekly content. Well, that's, you- that's 100% true. You know, there's that that baseball movie with, um, is it not Morgan Freeman? Earl Thomas and the other guy, and he says, he says uh, Ray, if you build it, they will come feel the dreams. Kevin Costner. If you build it, they will come, Ray. Your website is not like that. You can build the most beautiful website. It can work perfectly. It can aesthetically be pleasing and have all the right keywords and the metadata description can be correct. But if you don't get your SEO strategy right, if you don't connect to your audience on a visceral level in social media, your website traffic is basically going to be next to nothing. You have to connect with your audience. You have to give them content that they can consume. The podcast and the blogs are the easiest two forms of content that you can do that with. But social media, the first word of social media is social. And I think people forget that. It's like even your business page should have a social component to it. It's not a place to put out white papers and to treat like an old PR campaign to talk about, you know, this CEO or I'm sorry, this C-level person is retiring or we just brought on this new person for marketing whatever. I mean, certainly you can post those things, but that shouldn't be what it is all about. That shouldn't be all encompassing of what you've got products and, and announcements of hires and fires or whatever. It should mostly be like, what do you guys talk about at the water cooler and promote your vendors, promote your clients, right? Tell case studies about the things that you've done, the problems that you've solved and to, to tie this all together, make it humanistic right tell the human story the champion you know make someone else the champion and watch what happens because now you're gonna just like i was with project help you grow i exposed my heart to help people if you do that and people can't see the direct correlation how that helps your business the more you do that the more success your business will have on social media and here's another thing people forget travis i don't understand why how many employees do you have, right? Your business has however many employees it has. I have 33 employees right now. Is that crazy? 33 people that work for Bowman Digital Media. I want all of them to engage with not only the posts for Bowman Digital Media, but my clients' posts too, right? Let's like all a community of support as opposed to playing the crickets. Yeah, it it's amazing when you it do. I think difference if you can get people to. I think you mentioned that the, at the, at our group at the ranch, that if you're going to engage with someone's post, you can like support or whatever, but if you're going to comment, give us at least five words to help the algorithm make it look like something that it wants to show more people. Yeah. So they call them value add comments as opposed to just engagement. So a like or a thumbs up, if you will, because it's so common the weight for these algorithms is lower than if you give what we call a value added comment. So it takes five words. Now, every algorithm is a little different. So don't hold that feet, my feet to the fire on every platform. But as a general rule, it's true. It's certainly true on LinkedIn. Um, five words or more. And you don't want like good post, great post, awesome share. Forget that stuff, right? Because it actually can look at the words that you're using too. But like if you made a post about the Veterans Award podcast show that's coming up right and being uh looking for potential sponsors and i respond and say hey that's something that we would consider at bowman digital media let's talk about that you know privately that's a great value-added comment and what is it it took me 10 12 words to say it right Mm -hmm. well now you've got a comment that is potent and what you really want to your audience to do for your audience just you know so they can improve you want to become the top comment or in what we call the relevant comments. And that's one of the ways that you also can do that is by making a value-added comment. If you're doing just like good job or good share, great to see you, how's it going, those kinds of things, just, you know, off the the cuff or what we would call auto response. Like if you're you're using the response that the the AI is suggesting, it's probably not going to make a top comment or um, into the relevant comments. You have to like create a little bit, but invest. Here's what I will tell you, though. So many people are spending their time trying to be these content creators, 
which is not their natural skill set. And they have a very small following. So not even a lot of people would see it, even if it was like this great post. I tell people, if you would spend 80% or more of your time on social media making comments on posts of other people, as opposed to creating posts for yourself, you actually will grow your brand, your awareness, your visibility a lot further, a lot faster, including, let me ask you this, Travis. Let's say you make a post every single day and you notice that I comment on every one of your posts. What is the odds that you're going to come to one of my posts and return the favor? Uh, it's pretty are, high. And I just did are, this on LinkedIn. Yeah, I connected with the, uh, the owner of the Savannah Bananas. If this is the first time you've ever heard the phrase Savannah Bananas, Go do, do, go do a Google search. They are the most fan first engaging organization. Uh, as far as I can tell in the world, they are, I don't know what level of baseball. I'm just going to say triple A. It's probably not triple A. Triple A baseball team in Savannah, Georgia. And the owner walks around in a yellow like top hat and suit jacket because he's the bananas. And everything that they do is for the fan experience. They've got short videos of like the whole team, not just the pitcher, the whole team doing a little dance before the pitcher throws the ball. And they all do it at the same time in sync. I've seen, I've seen some of these videos now. Now I didn't put the name together with that, but I've seen, I've seen some, is that the, the, the pitcher sometimes takes a shirt off and stuff. And yeah, all sorts crazy. of crazy stuff. They had yeah, like they the, crazy. the team, like the crew, the back end guys, they like worked all weekend. And then at 1 AM, they played an impromptu kickball game with all the people that were there working after working alone because they wanted to. That's fun. It's, it's fun and it's gauging. And I've replied, I've come in on a couple of his things and no kidding. He has replied to me directly. And then I see his stuff on my posts. Uh, I did a job update yesterday or this weekend it says that I'm now the host of the veteran podcast awards, which I am check it out. Veteranpodcastawards.com. But I had a bunch of people send me messages in Messenger, and a lot of them use the auto AI response, like "Congrats on your new position." Yeah. Did yeah, I respond to those top, people? Did I respond? You're not going to get, but you're, you're not going to get top billing or uh, or a most relevant comment slot from LinkedIn with that, right? So, again, to the to the point, if you want to be seen, you've got to mm -hmm. spend more time making comments, because now look, even. 80, 80, let's say you got 80 comments. Those people are far more likely for you to remember that day than the other thousands of people that you're connected to that didn't respond, right? So any comments better than no comment for that, raising your visibility. But let's say of the 80, you've got 75 auto responses or they're really quick hitters. There's not a lot of effort you could tell. And then you got five of them that are like sentences or paragraphs. Those are the ones that you're going to, most likely be endeared to you know what i mean they're 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 investing in you and it will work especially if they do that again like let's say you want to meet gary v or simon sinek these are these are famous people on linkedin right they have i think gary v has five million and simon sinek has six million followers each okay so they have large crowds let's say you were to go make an intelligent comment on their post every single day for a year do you think that you have a much better chance of meeting them and engaging with them then if you make a comment or two every once in a while, it's like, hey, great post, or you just share their post. You know what I mean? Like the more you invest in people, it's just like anything else. The more you invest, the better chance you have at a return on investment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. with LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or any of them, TikTok, doesn't matter. If you make a post, it's going to be shown by a certain amount of people. I'm just going to tell you guys how this works. So the post gets released, it's to a test audience. Only a certain amount of people are going to see it. Now, the test audience, depending on how they respond, then the algorithm takes over and says, okay, we got this much of a response rate, so we're going to show this many people. Or we didn't get the minimum response rate, so now the post is, is put to bed. It's dead. You basically wasted your time. So you could do that with a small audience and maybe be seen by hundreds of people or a thousand people. You have to go to your post to know how your post performs. So let's say you get a hundred views or you get a thousand views, whatever. Gary V made a post this morning at nine o'clock 
um, basically nine o'clock Pacific time. Okay, in an hour, it had been engaged with by over two thousand people. I'm guessing from the formula conversions that I've come up with that it was seen by something like fifty thousand people. So let's say you were one of the thirty-seven people that actually made a comment on that post. You potentially could have been seen by fifty thousand people in an hour as opposed to a thousand people or 500 people or hundred people that normally would have seen your post. Now do the math. How many, how many comments can you make in, let's say you had 15 minutes, let's say you could make one every minute. So in 15 minutes, you could be seen by 50,000 times 15. And then do that every day, do it five days a week, 365 days a year. Watch what happens. You're going to be growing your visibility, just raising your visibility straight out of the gate, but also, you're going to be investing in these people that you're commenting on, and they have a much higher proclivity to return the favor because you paid it forward. And maybe they don't respond right away. Maybe Travis doesn't know who you are, and you comment on Travis's post, or you come to mine, and I don't know you. You comment on my post. And at first, I don't really, you know what I mean? I'm like, thank you for the support. I respond to every comment that somebody leaves on me. So that makes me a little bit unique. I respond to every single one. But at first, it will be generic because I don't know you. But the more I get to know you, like I might work in a baby got back reference. Just saying. You know what I mean? <laughs> like touchdown. I might put a funny picture or an emoji that's kind of like an inside joke. But the more I get to know you, like I might send you a calendar link and say, hey, let's jump on a call, man. I'd like to get to know you. Because I don't accept, like how many DMs do you think I get a day? I have, I have. You get like 600 a day. I have hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. Okay. I get DM requests every day, multiple, multiple times. Hey, can we, can we have a coffee, a virtual coffee? And I can't say yes to them. I just can't because I don't have the bandwidth, but the ones that I do accept are the ones that they're people that have engaged with me for a while. And so I feel like, you know, okay, I know enough about you now. I'm willing to invest the 10 minutes or 15 minutes because there's been a differential in in our relationship compared to the other people that are just, it's a cold outreach. You've, you've got to engage and you've got to be different than everyone else. I wanted to I, jump back to what I posted this week and just post an update on the job post. I got a handful of likes and I got a bunch of comments. Most use the algorithm. Congrats on your new role. There's yeah. one guy that really stuck out to me because he said, congrats on your new role. And then he added value. He's like, is there any, is there some way that I can help you with your new position? And I was like, this is refreshing. This is something different. We yeah. hadn't actually interacted at all prior to this engagement. So he saw that I had a new role and he took it upon himself to not only say congrats, but hey, is there some way I can add value to your life and your world in this, this time? And I wasn't sure what to say. So I was like, hey, I, thanks so much. I hate for a asking for something, you know, the first time that we, we chatted. So I'm like, how long have you been podcasting? Like, and we started a whole conversation. Out of all the people that messaged me, He's the only one that I went actually back and forth with because yeah, he did yeah. something different. He did something engaging and he did something selfless asking how he can provide me now, value. Let me ask you a question. Cause I don't know if you're connected to this guy or not, but let's say he, he did that. You had that exchange and he sent you a, a, a connection request on LinkedIn. What's the odds that you're going to accept it? Oh, hundred percent. Right. Right. And so, so think about that out there, folks, you know, you want to connect with people. The problem with most most people is they're either doing automated stuff, it's not, it's there's no humanistic to it, or they fire their shot in a connection request uh, message. It's like, hey, let's connect, and I've got this. I want to talk to you about this. It's like I don't care. I don't even read those. Can I be honest? I don't read them at all. Why? Because if I really knew you, you wouldn't need that connection request message. In fact, even with my 30,000, which I'm at the limit, I'm always at the limit. Okay. So to connect with somebody new, what do I have to do? I have to go in my network and I have to find somebody and blow them out. That's what I have to do. If we talk all the time, you'll never get blown out. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. So, but if somebody, if I, if I find somebody interesting in my comments, I'll find someone, I'll blow them out and I'll send them a connection room because they're like, Hey, I really appreciate, you know, your support. And I think we could be friends. Let's connect. So the key, I tell people this, the key to everything you want to do professionally, at least, starts with the comments. It really does. You shouldn't be starting with uh, emails or direct messages 
or content, creating content. You start with the comments in their posts because why? Everybody's favorite converse, conversation topic, whether they like to admit it or not, is themselves. You want to talk about yourself. You want to talk about the things you're interested in. And you're going to be interested in the people who are interested in the things that you're interested in, right? Because that old adage is true. It isn't even what they said. You're not going to remember it anyways. You're just going to remember how they made you feel. Like at the end of Texas, think about this. All the conversations, all the training, all the information that was put to us, what do we remember the most? I remember how Fletcher Cox made me feel. I remember him cleaning my dishes, which I thought was insane. And here's a guy making a buttload of money. He's a Pro Bowl NFL player, a 10-year vet, great guy. He's yeah. been successful on multiple levels, and he's taken my – plate i'm like that dude is mississippi humble all day you know he's not faking anything he's a real down to earth guy so i remember i'll always remember that servant leader heart of his and then the training we got there was a lot of great stuff i'm sitting in front of a two notebooks full of information that i wrote like i had writer's cramp right but what <laughs> i remember the most about that training was the the fun stuff that happened before, after, and during the breaks, because that yeah. was the emotional, the emotional relevance for me, right? The relationships that were built. Yeah, how you feel that electricity that's running through the air, and you come up like it's the social, but it's the social part, right? I mean, social. I think that's again, people, even with LinkedIn, they think, oh, I have to be, you know, 100% professional. So let me ask you this: If I was working with you, and we're, you know, let's say we're 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 at the same level, it doesn't matter. We're working at the same place, doing basically the same job. We're cubicle mates or our offices are next to each other. We're at the water cooler. What are you talking about? You're talking about a spreadsheet? Probably not. You're talking about the latest analytical numbers that came in or the new widget that you guys are manufacturing? Probably not. What are you talking about? What did you watch on the TV last night? Who won the game? How's your wife doing your cake? I read your kids sick. How's your kid doing? You're talking about those types of things, right? So LinkedIn, it's the same thing. People are not there to work. By definition, it's social media. They're goofing off. So why do you think they want to talk about work? They're there for to be entertained. They're there to make friends. They're not there to talk about the spreadsheet or the widget. I promise you. I've talked about this, this stuff in the, in the past. Got, those that have met me in person know that I am kind of a goofball. Kind of a jackass. Are, so kind, of <laughs> <crazy. laughs> kind of just say some crazy stuff. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of times I want people to get engaged, and but I want to do a couple of things. I want to make sure that I am remembered in that interaction. Yeah. yeah. It was a long time I didn't care if it was remember me for good, remember me for bad. I didn't really care. But I really want to be, I want to file good folders on people. When we have interactions that we have feeling attached to, we file those in our filing folder in our head. And every time we interact with someone that has a file, you pull out the file, you remember how you feel about the thing. I want that when my name shows up on the phone, when I show up on camera with people, when I'm in person with them, they're like, oh, I'm having a meeting with Travis later. I can't wait for that meeting. I can't yeah. wait for and that And I'm not going to blow it off. I'm not going to, I'm not going to blow it off. Like, yeah, you were giving, oh, they were giving you a hard time because of the holiday. But anyways, but I would have missed this call. Like I even called you. I mean, it doesn't full disclosure. I called you yesterday and said, Hey, some stuff's going. I might be a little late, but I want to make sure that, that we were good. Like it's definitely happening. Even if I'm like tardy by a minute or two, which I wasn't, thank God. But yeah, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that I wasn't blowing you off. Yeah, absolutely. And that's when you build that kind of relationship with people, what regardless if you're in business or not or whatever, because you never know how that's going to be play out. Tell me if you've seen this, Ira. You go to an in-person event. People stop and they, they say what their name is. And by the time everyone's taught, you can't remember hardly anyone. You might've taken a note on one person because they got a business thing that you're interested in talking to, but you don't hardly remember them. You walk around you shake hands and you act professional, which is just an act. Right. Uh, I think for the most part, Especially if you know me, it's very, much an act. <laughs> <laughs> but you maybe get a couple of uh, business cards and you come home and you throw them in the desk. And you never do anything with them. Yeah. Like, I want to engage with people. I want to know what gets people fired up. So, I want to know the thing that they care about. That's why I started using LinkedIn back in 2009, the way I was using it for that reason. So 
Because before that, you know, when I started networking back in 2000, like going to networking events, I was the guy that thought the winner of the event was the one who left with the most cards. So my whole goal, which is completely stupid, but my whole goal was to race around as fast as I could and make sure I got my card in every single person's hand and I got their card, more importantly, in my hand so that I could bug them the next couple of days because that's all I was really doing was calling and bugging them because I didn't take the time to meet anyone. It was so dumb. I learned the hard way that that was dumb. And if you're still doing that, that's dumb. Stop it. Okay. So instead, what you want to do is pick like five people. Depends on how long the, the event is, but let's say it's two hours, three hours. Pick like five people and just get to know them. Don't make statements. I want you to only ask questions. Only ask questions. Let them talk until they slow down or take a breath. Then ask them another question until they walk away from you. But I promise you, those people at the end of the day, like the next day when you go to reach out and call them or email them, those are the ones that will take your call. They'll actually return your email because mm. all they remember about that conversation, they don't remember anything that was said. They just remember, dude, that guy was interesting. You know why you're interesting? Because you let them talk about them. You ask them <laughs> questions about them. That's all, that's all it is. So Every, what, everyone's favorite topic is let me tell you about me. Yeah. So what was I doing? Remember, so what I was doing is I was going on LinkedIn and I was doing some research about you know, like what school did they go to, what hobbies they had. I was trying to figure out whatever I could. I'll tell you one thing that I did. I started doing that was actually really smart too. I would try to find them on Facebook because then you get the real, like what they're actually interested in. I don't even do business cards. I give them a thank you poker chip that they look at longer than any business card, but I connect with them on social media before I walk away from them. Well now, so now I'm talking, I'm talking about, remember, I'm talking about like 2009 and 2015 and stuff. When you had, most people weren't that sophisticated yet. I love what you're saying though. And I do. I do like that. I like that strategy. But back then, that's all I was doing is I was looking them up, trying to figure out what questions I could ask so that when I was in front of them, I could ask questions I knew they were more likely to respond to. You know what I mean? Like, hey, do you like to fish? I mean, it seems it seems innocuous enough, but if you've been on their Facebook and you see that they go bass fishing every Friday through Sunday, you know what I mean? Then you know they're going to want to talk about fishing, and that's just a in, – in, unintrusive way to start that conversation and then get them to tell you fish stories for the next 15, 20 yeah. minutes. What's your favorite place to go bass fishing? What's the stupidest thing you did as a teenager that you're so lucky no one knows about? What's the time that you were so embarrassed and can you think of anyone else that you know, can you think of their embarrassing story? Cause they can't. I you am know? so, I am so glad that I grew up before social media was big time. Uh, fully, fully in agreement there. Yeah. Fully in agreement. We used to go, me and my buddies would go, uh, we're Northern Minnesota. We would go find bridges to jump off of bridges into <laughs> like little channels of the lake bridges. over. So rivers. the answer to your question is if your friend jumped off a bridge, your answer was yes. yes <laughs> Let's do it. I'll bring <laughs> uh, no it. one. Now it'd be everyone to leave your phones in the car. Cause we don't want, uh, we don't want evidence of this, but that's what we did. We were running around and we find cool places to jump off bridges into rivers, meet girls, all that fun stuff. Uh, Cause that's, I mean, what was there to do in the the early, the mid nineties, you know, like go get in trouble, go exploring, go find stuff, go hang out. Yeah. Yeah, Learn about life. I did a lot of stuff that I'm glad is not on social media. Hey, Ira, I'm loving every minute of this thing. I, thank you so much for providing so much value, talking about the history of LinkedIn, how all the different levels of connection work, what it's like to actually be other people oriented and not care and be so much about yourself. As not. Tell us, uh, before we get wrapped up here, I know that you do work with uh, the Barrett Foundation. Tell us a little bit about the nonprofit you do work with. So Barrett Foundation is kind of cool. Um they're out of New Jersey, but they're basically New York City, right? So they're they're in Newark there. But the Barrett Foundation, which has been around for quite a while, that's community art by the community for the community. So they support social equality, and it's it's more than just art. But they're trying to holistically address, um, you know, the the challenges that we face as a community, but give a safe, safe space for people to come of any, any demographic that you can think of. Yes, you're welcome, no matter who you are. Um, but they'll create 
these, some of them are huge, like 11, 12 feet tall. Um, a lot of times they call them animodules. So there's usually an animal element to it, like a giraffe or a lion or uh, an ox. I mean, they've had, they've made all kinds of things, birds, rabbits. I mean, everything you can think of animal wise, but typically what happens is they have, have these cool shapes and they're freestanding. And then the community uh, group will come in and they'll do uh, the painting. So they'll, they'll decorate it. And then they get placed around the community. Like they were just in Times Squares. Uh, they had in New York City's Times Square. They were there, I believe, at the end of April. So if you go like on their Instagram, their Facebook, or their LinkedIn page, you can see some of these pictures. But if you just go to barrettfoundation.org, um, you can see more of them. But they have, for homeschoolers and for people that are looking for art projects at home, they have a DIY kit, which is pretty cool. It's 27 bucks. But basically, that's the idea, is they're trying to promote community and it's community art. Again, people in the community come and they decorate and do the art and then it gets displayed publicly uh, out in the community. So I specifically helped, I built their website. When I say I, I mean Bowman Digital Media, we built their website. And then we also help them with their social media management. That's what we do for them. Oh, that is really cool. I appreciate your heart. appreciate you sharing with me. I appreciate uh, being in your inner circle, brother. Uh, if you wanna connect with Ira, Start with the comments first. Okay, he doesn't have room for you. So if you want him to make room, you got to give him a reason to do so, whether it's on LinkedIn or Instagram. Check out all of his yeah. great work at BowmanDigitalMedia.com. Do you have anything else you'd like to share, Ira? Yeah, I just want to make sure people understand. When I'm, when I'm talking about this comment strategy, this comment strategy works on every single social media platform there is. So if, you're bit, if you want to grow on Twitter and you don't have enough Twitter followers, the way you get them to grow organically is you just start making comments on other people's tweets, right? Reply. Go to the YouTube video. You watch a video, like maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Leave a comment. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you something else. People love this. Invite your friends into the comment section of somebody that you would like to meet. Post. So you make the comment. You tag them. And like, let's say we're in... Um, Who's somebody that you mentioned? Joel. I think you mentioned. Oh, Kareen. You mentioned Kareen. Okay, Kareen LeBroom. So, so Kareen's our friend. She makes a post. Travis or I would go into the post, comment, and then we would write the at symbol. And then I would write at Travis Johnson. He would write at Ira Bowman. And then we might invite other people too. The more people that you invite to the party and they show up, and now you've got a string of like, you made a comment and now there's 10 comments in the comment string. I guarantee you if you do stuff like that, People will notice, they'll appreciate it. And again, do that like four or five times. I almost guarantee you they will reach out to you and say, hey, I really appreciate all this. You want to connect? <laughs> I'm connected to the guy that created Craigslist. That's the way I got connected to the guy who created Craigslist. I'm connected to a bunch of people. So I'm a Raiders fan. We haven't talked about football at all, but I connected to Lincoln Kennedy, who is a former pro bowler for the lot. Well, he at the time it was the Oakland Raiders, okay, the Las Vegas Raiders now. But I connected to him. He's the he's on the radio calling the Raider games. Yeah. I'm not famous. I promise you, he doesn't give a crap that I have two hundred thousand followers. He does not care. The reason why he connected with me is because he would make posts and I would make intelligent comments on a regular basis and we became social media friends. Yeah, that's that's crazy. It between between getting involved on these comment parties, which I absolutely love, and doing things with nonprofits, especially a nonprofit that they care about, is such a great way to get connected. I've got uh, a 100%. couple of NFL connections here in Oklahoma City. I helped Ricky Brady with his nonprofit. He played for the Chiefs and the Cowboys. Fun fact, yeah. he's got buddies Chris Chandler, who played for the Raiders, and Billy Behema, who's a Super Bowl winner with the Ravens they all hang out together. So I got to go hang out with them all and do all sorts of events because I was giving back to something that he cared about. Yep. And what a great way to connect and provide value you touched, first. You touched the heartstrings and you added value and you weren't what we call a sycophant or just some, you know, social media doesn't have to be fake. It doesn't have to be phony. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, any of the, any of those shallow things, it can be real people making real friendships, making a real difference. You're talking about nonprofits. You're talking about celebrities. 
And what are they? They're just like the rest of us. They have a heart for things. If you can figure out what resonates with them and talk about it, contribute to it, I promise you, again, it's called social media for a reason. I, I just, I wish people would figure what that actually means. It doesn't mean come try to be a fake celebrity. It isn't about showing people, if you listen to what we've said in the show, it isn't about putting out all the things that are perfect. It's actually your idiosyncrasies. That's the thing that people like the best. You know, like the, the, the struggles that we share. So on LinkedIn, just really fast, in 2022 and 2021, the biggest performance posts that I've had of all the things that I've talked about and all the things that I've done, and I've done some really cool things. You can go check it out. But I've done some really neat things. The thing that people have responded to and the posts that have got the most attention have been the things I've shared about my daughter. Nothing to do with professional. Nothing to do with me accomplishment-wise. It's a struggle. It's a personal struggle. It's a battle that we're going through. It's been going on for almost a full year now. But those are those posts, those are the ones that get seen by hundreds of thousands of people. I get tens of thousands of engagements on these posts. It has nothing to do with anything but my personal life. And my it's my daughter. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if you can find things like that to talk about and just be open, you know, you're gonna find much more success. But again, it isn't even about being social media, what everybody thinks. I want to be an influencer. Well, don't influence with content, influence with comments. Comments, comments, comments. comments. Hey, that, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Ira, thank you so much for being my guest today. Man, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Travis. Oh, absolutely. If you like this show and want to start your own show, go to nonprofitarchitect.org. Check out the resource section. We've got a full guide in there. It's about 60 pages. Shows you how to do all the stuff that we do here. And if you want to get college credit, we've got a course approved at Forbes Business School of Technology. And you can take it whether you're a student there or not. And you can get it transferred into your college, your school for college credits. There's no other podcast course on the market that's available for college credit. We'll see you again next week.